Amr said, my name is Nick Fletcher. I'm a children's orthopedist at Emory in Atlanta. Um, I think this is as fun an event as, uh, as there is. We get to listen to ourselves talk about st statistics all the time, and it's really fun to sort of have a little bit more casual talk about, uh, about scoliosis. So I was given the charge of talking about bracing. Just so I have a feel, how many people in the room are in a brace or have been braced? So a pretty good number. Um, so hopefully this will this will help. So this comes up a lot. Obviously, this is a common condition like we talked about for those of us who see a lot of scoliosis. This is probably the most common discussion, discussion that I have. Um, and it usually goes something like this. So I say you need a brace. Somebody gets on their phone, and there's texting that's, that goes on while I'm talking about it. And they t text their friend, and then this is the image that comes up with the brace, and then <laughs> my life is over, and then, and then, and then we get in a little bit deeper into the discussion. So bracing is a really old treatment. It's been around for a long time. These are some of the, the, uh, our fathers of bracing, so John Moe and Walter Blount, who uh, were, were critical in creating our first brace, uh, that at least that the Scoliosis Society really uh, talks about, which is the Milwaukee brace. Um, and this was a really neat invention because for a long time we didn't really have a, a good way of controlling curvatures, but there were some obvious problems with it. So uh, the brace was, was made with a sort of a torso structure that then uh, extended up onto the neck. And one of the challenges with that, of course, is that in sort of modern times, if you will, meaning the past 30 or 40 years, that's been a little bit less well tolerated from a uh, cosmetic concern. So. Uh, I'm a big Boston fan. Boston's done a lot of really good things in sports recently. They also, back in 1972, came up with a, with a treatment for those who didn't really want to have the big neck extension. And so they, uh, the uh, sort of father of uh, Boston Children's Spine, uh, John Hall, and, and others came up with what was known now as the Boston Brace, the TLSO Brace. And so this has become sort of the workhorse for us as, uh, as uh, children's spine surgeons. Um, and, and it's more if they're, if you look into articles on this, there are 20 or 30 different types of bracing, but still the Boston brace is the most common. We're going to talk about some others today, uh, such as the Rego up top, the Charleston and the Boston, and the uh, Providence brace. Um, so, um, so the question that still has come up, ah, sorry, I'm forward a little bit. Um, the question that has come up over and over in clinic is what, where's the evidence? And I think that for a long period of time, there, we were limited by the fact that we were relying really on patient and family recall as to how often you, you were wearing the brace. And so I've got an eight and 10 year old and they don't always tell the truth. And I think that sometimes can be a problem in teenagers as well. And so we were saying, this brace works better than this brace because these 20 patients told me that they wore it all the time. So that's, that's so it definitely worked better. But in fact, uh, we, we were sort of, we, we were hampered by the fact that we couldn't tell exactly how, how much they were wearing the brace. So one of my mentors uh, in the upper right there, Tony Herring, and, and an orthotist who we worked very closely with, worked on this um, just under a decade ago. Um, and they implemented a, a small heat uh, sensor that was placed into the brace. You can see that right there. Um, and this was really, really accurate. So they were able to tell whether or not the brace was, say, taken off and maybe put in the locker or taken off and put in a car, even in a Dallas uh, uh, car in the summer where, uh, where it gets pretty hot. That's where, where this was out of. And so you can see how the brace or how the uh, little sensor was applied. And with that, you were able to get a report card. So you guys have report cards at school. You were able to get a report card with your brace. And then we could really have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion. You're, not, you're wearing your brace. You're not wearing your brace. And this has become much, much more uh, commonly used. And a lot of orthotists around the country are able to implement these. And the technology is improving such that you can get a report card and, and talk to your kids. And there's actually been some follow-up studies that have shown that when the surgeon is able to present that to their, to their patients, that the patients get a little bit more compliant. Um, the other thing that it showed is how well braces work. And so this was really, in my mind, uh, one of the, the, the landmark studies. And I'm trying to minimize the number of graphs. Um, but basically, what this showed is as you wear your brace less, the success rate goes down. As you wear your brace less, the failure rate goes up, right? So um, in this study, they sort of used about a 12-hour cut off based on some of the numbers that they have. But you can see a really drastic difference in, uh, in success rate when you, uh, when you stop wearing your brace. Um, this was probably the most uh, important study. And I bet there's people in the crowd who have, uh, who have actually looked at this study. This is a study that was presented uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is like you know the, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. This is our number one. Uh, medical journal in, in all the world, and it's, to my knowledge, the only children's orthopedic uh, article that's ever made it 
uh, into that journal. So this is a really, really impactful study. And it was done in a way uh, where we were able to actually compare it to uh, non-operative treatment. So this was, uh, the, these were patients who were randomized either to a brace or to, to, uh, to observation. And there was a group that, that chose the randomization. That can, that can be a little bit hard to convince families to do at times. And so there was also a group that chose, to, chose their own treatment. Um, we used the typical indications for bracing that you can see here. And what we found were, was that braces work. If you compare them to sort of not bracing, the success rate was significantly higher to the point they actually had to stop the study early, but only if it was worn. So you can see here, and, and Mike showed this earlier, in the group that didn't wear their brace, the success rate was very low. And once you get up above uh, 12 and a half to, to 17 hours, you can see that uh, that you sort of get a little bit of law diminishing returns kicking in where the, the impact isn't quite as much. But obviously, more wear equals better results. And I always tell families, this is like a medication you can't take too much of. Um, this is, you know, it's like, like taking a, um, uh, an aspirin a day. It's, it's, it's um, you know, if you do that for your whole life, it, it decreases your heart, uh, heart risk. Um, the more you wear it, the better. The better. Um, and again, if you can wear it at least 12 to 13 hours a day, if you can, and, and obviously uh, more than that help, seems to help. Bracing does not, however, work any better than not bracing, especially if you wear it less than six to seven hours a day. And unfortunately, even if your uh, child is, uh, is wearing it well, if they're really, really young, the success rate is a little bit lower. Um, the brace doesn't typically correct the curve permanently in most cases. So if you put the brace on, our goal is to keep it roughly where it's at. Sometimes we do see a little bit of improvement. Sometimes we get lucky, and we'll talk about that in a minute with some of the newer braces. That we're actually seeing a little bit more uh, bigger improvement than we have historically. So then the question comes down, what brace do you wear? And I think the biggest thing uh, that, that we look at, at least at our institution, is who the orthotist is we're working with. You have to have a good relationship with an orthotist, both on our end, but really even more importantly on yours, because you'll see them more sometimes than you see us. Um, and so it's important that you work with an orthotist who knows what, how to make a, a good brace that the surgeon trusts or at least has, has a lot of history in making braces. This is the most common brace again. This is what that brace study was, was founded on. This is the traditional Boston TLSO brace. Um, and it opens in the back. Um, who's, who has a Boston brace in here? I see a couple. So th this is the most common one. Um, it uses a combination of sort of pushing the spine over, what we call translation, as well as a little bit of derotation. And you make a little hole in the brace. You can see that uh, on, the re on her left side, um, screen's right, uh, where, where the spine sort of can rotate into. Um, as they've gotten better, they're a little bit lower profile. They are, again, supported by the most data, predominantly the brace study. So if you want something that has the most evidence behind it, that's your brace. Um, but it is typically required as a day and nighttime brace. This is something that uh, has gained a little bit of popularity, I'll be honest, in the south, uh, particularly southeast, more than uh, perhaps other areas of the country. This is a nighttime brace. And the nighttime brace is great because it's only worn at night. And one of the biggest challenges that I deal with in Atlanta, even coming from Dallas where I did some training before, is that Atlanta is really humid, sort of like it is down here. And it's hard to wear a brace in the middle of the summer. And so this is an option for kids because it, uh, it has been shown in some curves to be beneficial at night. Um, but again, it's a discussion to have with your physician. So it's a nighttime brace because of that sort of how long it is, it's hard to walk around with it, so the kids have to be laying down. Um, it's usually indicated in spines that are in curves that are lower down in the spine, what we call thoracolumbar lumbar curves. But sometimes we'll use it in higher up curves, again, if you're looking at compliance issues. And it sort of helps guide the spine straight. That's how we think that it works. This has uh, become much, much, much more popular. Anybody in here have a Rego brace? Okay, so no. So there, this is something that has, uh, that has gained a lot of traction. This is one of my patients in a Rego brace. We actually don't make this in Atlanta. The typically, uh, current patients have to travel to one of the few centers in the country that are still doing it. Um, this is predicated on this thing called a hypercorrection mold, where basically you put the patient's torso, that's what, that's what you can see there on the left, in the brace, and over time the, the torso will actually change and derotate to fit the brace. And this has been... Uh, uh, supported in a little bit older literature back from the 90s, but then more recently, Dr. Sponsler uh, just came out with a publication comparing this to the Boston TLSO, and they showed a really uh, impressive improvement in, uh, in success rate with the Rego versus the TLSO. So this is a very interesting area. There's a lot of research going on um, in the, in the uh, world of Rego. Um, and spine core. So spine core was something that was developed actually uh, at Stefan's institution up at St. Justine in Montreal. Um, currently, this has sort of fallen out of favor with surgeons, and it's more favored by chiropractors. 
And it uses what's known as active correction, and it's this sort of uh, complex wording of postural disorganization, muscular dysfunction, and unsynchronized spinal growth. So that, that's how, how it was uh, termed. Um, but to date, it's still sort of poorly supported by much data. Um, it's very well supported by Dr. Google. Dr. Google loves the spine core. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that says, you know, come see this, use this. This is the only proven treatment for scoliosis. And hopefully through the talks today, you'll realize that there are a lot of different treatments and there's not, none of this is a panacea. None of this works for everybody. Um, the one really good study, actually, Stefan's institution put on, compared this to the Boston TLSO. So again, sort of against the gold standard, this was retrospective, meaning it wasn't done with the temperature sensors. Um, but they did show a uh, worse result in patients with spine core. Um, so you can see about a two and a half to three times higher rate of progression with spine core. So again, this isn't typically uh, favored by, uh, by most of the orthopedists, but it still has a large amount of traction in the community. So um, bottom line, bracing works. You have to wear it. Um, as Mike said, there's no easy way out of it, um, but it's worth it in the end. Um, your chance of success is always going to be better. The smaller your curve is, the older you are, the um, and, how, and, and the more compliant you are. And there's a lot of work on our end to continue to do so that we can continue to help our patients in, uh, in the future. So thank you guys very much. This is terrific.